Talk, Movie Talk, Movie Fans. I'm your host, Natasha Martinez, and this is the daily show where we give you all the latest news in the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us today is Mark Ellis. Welcome, one and all, to the best damn movie news show in the entire galaxy. Like Natasha said, my name is Mark, and by God, we are live today for Taco Tuesday, talking about movies. So much excitement. Natasha, who's joining me today? Joining us today is Dennis Sen. Yeah, sorry about the live streaming yesterday. I don't know why YouTube didn't work yesterday. Works today, just fine. And the, me and some of the crew came here early to try and get Comic-Con hotel room. <laughs> <laughs> and one of those people was John Schnipp. Actually, I didn't get here oh. early. I, I didn't know it was today. I thought it was tomorrow. So I guess I don't get a hotel room. Uh, See you later. Uh, Bye. On behalf of everybody trying to get a hotel room, <laughs> thank you You're for welcome. not knowing. Yeah. Yeah. How do we do, know. Dennis? Uh, we don't, won't find out until Friday. Oh, wow. Okay. It's like, did we make the team? Yes. We're about to find out. Well, speaking of finding stuff out, you guys are about to get a couple breaking news stories so damn fresh they're not even on the sidebar. And to help us with those, we have Natasha. The latest trailer for Steven Spielberg's The BFG was released this morning, which includes new, never-before-seen footage from the movie. The BFG tells the imaginative story of a young girl and the giant who introduces her to the wonders of perils of giant country. The BFG stars Oscar winner Mar Mark Rylance, newcomer Ruby Barnhill, Penelope Wilton, Jermaine Clement, Rebecca Hall, and Bill Hader. Well, the most important name in the BFG is clearly Steven Spielberg because he's the guy directing it. And I, not that he needs a comeback pitch after Bridge of Spies, but it's nice to see Spielberg re-embrace his roots as a blockbuster filmmaker. That's what this movie looks like. It's going to be entertaining for people of all ages. I personally did not care that much about this trailer before I watched it because I'm like, yeah, it's going to be good. Like, you just, you give the guy a pass because you know he's going to make an entertaining movie, but not necessarily something that's really going to tug on my heartstrings. I watched this trailer. I really like the big freaking giant. I'm sure that's what BFG stands for. I really like looking, the way that Mark Rylance looks as a giant. That was the big reveal in this trailer. You get to see the look of not only that giant, but then you get a money shot at the end with all these other mean giants coming in. So apparently most giants in the world are bullies, but there's a couple nice giants. That's the one that's been grabbing this girl in the middle of the night and having some fun with her at least that's how it appears from the trailer so schnapp you saw this thing you are a giant man yourself <laughs> what did you think of how your people were represented my people were represented very well i will see about warcraft how that does but bfg gets a pass from the big people um no i liked i liked the, the final reveal of the giant he's definitely definitely has that very uh cartoony look where he's like got the super giant ears and the weird long nose and the thin neck but now it's in 3d so it's kind of more disturbing like if it was just a drawing you'd be like ugh. But now it's real, so it's kind of like, whoa, it's See a little that weird. hand going Yeah, at, yeah. It's kind of creepy, uh, but I also liked, uh, it's it's fun. Once he kind of uh, kidnaps the little child, uh, and then he's like running around. Some of it reminded me of Iron Giant, where they had those low angle shots of the Iron Giant running, you know, stuff like that. It was kind of magical. It's hard. To, it's really hard to tell right now. I need a third trailer is what I need, but... Right now, I like the way the big people are represented. Yeah, one of the things <laughs> I, that I really liked about this trailer was the way that they just, they so seamlessly blend into the environment because you see just a normal sized human being like me or Dennis walking on the street and then the giant, then he looks it back and then the giant just fades in. Mm -hmm. So the, like they always know how to chameleon themselves. Dennis, what about this trailer stood out to you? Well, yesterday, I think we got asked during live Twitter questions about BFG and I think me and Clark were the ones that were kind of more not down on it but just not that interested seeing this trailer definitely piqued my interest somewhat still not 100% sold on it like if it wasn't Spielberg I mean for sure I'm watching this movie because it's Spielberg but I don't know if I would be that interested if it wasn't him I mean seeing all the animation of the Giants was cool but you know it's not his fault but I get in the back of my mind, I'm thinking of Jack the Giant Slayer. Oh, yes. I look at those, no, I, and, and, and I'm scared. You know what I mean? It, it's probably not going to be like that. It's probably going to get a lot more magical, a lot more fun, a lot more entertaining. But just it, it, it gives me hesitation. You're That's, right. Jack the Giant Killer, that killed it for all giant films for like 40 years. And <laughs> Spielberg's like, I'm going to bring back the Giants. It's like, uh, does that guy sleep? Does he have like clones? I mean, how is he making so many films? Like, I didn't even know he's always like, oh, doing Ready Player One. What is this already done? Yeah. Like, when did he make this? I Obviously think something happened on the set of Close Encounters of the third right. time when he had an encounter himself. And now there's nine Spielbergs walking around at any given time. They can bolt run into one giant, which is probably an extra they used in the BFG. Definitely. It's just a short answer I came up with. What's Love our it. next super news story? Okay, today Lucasfilm president Kathleen Kennedy and Star Wars veteran Mark Hamill released a video announcing a new campaign sponsored 
sponsored by CrowdRise in support of Star Wars Force for Change. The short video includes Kathleen Kennedy talking about Star Wars Force for Change with Mark Hamill si sitting silently by not saying a word, unsure whether or not he had any lines in the Star Wars video. For the campaign starting on April 5th, Lucasfilm and Disney will match the donations of Star Wars fans to four select charities up to $1 million. Well, this means that, yes, it's great that Star Wars does so much good in the communities around the world and also that w we always have Star Wars in our lives. You're not going to go one week without something new happening in the Star Wars movie universe. And this is just another example, a lot like what they did with the charity videos for Episode 7. It seems they're going to be doing a similar kind of campaign, maybe even on a larger scale for Episode 8. And I think it's great. I liked watching this video. I got a kick out of it. Mark Hamill seems to be enjoying teasing us about Luke Skywalker and what he's been up to because like the video references we didn't see him talk in episode so we got to see the dude which is good thanks for being alive now yeah. we want to see what he has to say in episode eight so that's going to be one of the big things clearly that ramps up their ad campaign not just with the charity shows but also with the previews and the trailers and everything that we're going to see from this movie until we're actually in theaters not this christmas but next christmas so i thought this was a really cute video and they're doing something nice for the kids right dennis yeah i mean there you can pick which charity it goes to i think like unicef and red cross and all that stuff and and it was a cute, it was a funny bit there. Though uh, last year's when, when JJ did his, he kind of mixed it in being on set. So like that would pull more people mm -hmm. in. I hope they do that for the second one so that more people will get interested in yeah, it. Yeah, you saw that creature in the background yeah, walking. Right. You're like, they're using practical effects. No, and not, only that, money. not only that, in During Force Awakens, when that puppet came out, I was like, that's the <laughs> one from the, 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 the video. <laughs> Even right. though he had like no consequence on the movie that's whatsoever. Right. He doesn't talk or do no. anything. He stands hey, behind. Hey, that guy holds a lot of pots <clears> and pans. I will not have you disparage that creature. What's his name? I, I don't know. Uh, his name. Skrill's on. Uh, <laughs> I think every time I watch Force Awakens, I expect him to talk at the end. I'm just like, man, it's going to happen this time. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. <laughs> so, you know, we could all look forward to Hamill uh, yapping it up in episode eight. He's literally has all of the lines. I think that was in his contract. I get to say all the lines. He's literally so. just mimicking everybody else, yeah. too. In everyone the movie. else has to be silent. I mean, look, one of the things that we've been privy to, uh, particularly if you guys watch Jedi Council, which I'm fortunate enough to be on most of the time, is that you see these updates like on Twitter or Instagram from everybody on set at Episode Eight, particularly Mark Hamill, and how much fun they're having making this movie so far, and that Mark Hamill is a guy who is a world caliber teaser. The guy knows how to tease fans, how to goose us, get us intrigued as to what's going on, but never giving away too much as to the wizard behind the curtain. So this is just another indication that they're having a lot of fun with us. And I'm pretty sure that Luke Skywalker will talk in episode eight. That's just our take. Okay, Natasha, what's our first official story of the day? <clears throat> now that Doctor Strange has wrapped filming, Marvel is gearing up for its first co-production with Sony Studios to film Spider-Man. Fans have already begun speculating on the names for the picture, with many hoping for a nod to the comics again with the spectacular Spider-Man. But if the report by BBC is to, belie to be believed, the movie has already been given a title. BBC is said to have noticed that Sony registered the domain name Spider-Man Homecoming the movie.com late last week, suggesting the movie is titled Spider-Man Homecoming. Though the report on Collider.com cautions domain names aren't 100% reliable, in the same article they do mention it's happened before when the title of Skyfall, another Sony movie, was revealed because of its registered domain. While we wait for official word from Sony and Marvel, we'll all be treated to the all-new iteration of Spider-Man when he appears in Captain America Civil War next month. Mark, what are your thoughts on the possible title Spider-Man Homecoming? My my thoughts are this, Natasha. Um, man, I really hope they just registered that domain to throw us off the scent because I don't think Homecoming is a great mm. title for this Spider-Man movie. Um, but my thoughts have gone more positive to the to the consideration of Spider-Man Homecoming being the title after we were in our pre-production meeting when we're kicking around the stories, what we're going to talk about, and then Schnepp comes in and says, "Oh, they registered some other domain names as well." Schnepp, do you want to recount some of those that we were? Treated yeah. to this morning. Some other awesome titles. Spider Man suspended. Uh, Spider Man greatness. What was the greatness, greatness awaits? awaits. Yeah. We had uh, Spider Man coming of age. Yeah. Um. So there's a lot of titles that they have registered domain names for Spider Man and. 
judging from those other ones, I would take Spider-Man Homecoming versus anything else, but it just doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. Now, something you have to remember is that Sony controls a lot of different Spider-Man properties, not necessarily just the movies, so maybe they're trademarking something else coming out down the road because, let's face it, Spider-Man is their giant tentpole franchise now in conjunction with Marvel, but it's at Sony. So when they release this new Spider-Man movie, they're probably going to want to release maybe a TV show, maybe a cartoon, an animated series, uh, some sort of a comic book. So there's going to be a lot of things going on in the Spider-Man universe when this movie comes out that aren't necessarily tied just to the movie. So maybe that's the glimmer of hope. But Dennis, you hear Spider-Man Homecoming. What's your read on that? Yeah, I wasn't too excited when I heard that because we know that it's set in high school, but naming it Homecoming just implies more of that kind of YA teenage soap opera. Mm -hmm. Is it? Is he gonna have a fight? Is the end fight gonna be him at, at the homecoming dance or something <laughs> like that? I just dance I, off. Yeah, <laughs> like I, I, I hope it's not that, and I don't think it is. I think they should just tile it like Spider Man or part of the MCU now or something like that. Yeah, Spider Man, Sadie Hawkins. Will she ask him? <laughs> Tune in to find Spider Man out. forever. <laughs> it's, it's, it does sound like something you write in a stupid notebook. Spider-Man Homecoming. It's horrible. It's a horrible title. It does Anyway, guys. Spider-Man coming of age, <laughs> not much better. So no. look, Greatness awaits. Detention. What first about period, the spectacular Spider-Man? Like the spectacular Spider-Man, Web of Spider-Man. They got a bunch of other comic books they haven't used the title for. Well, here, here's what handicaps them a little bit, in my opinion, is that like that we've already had Spider-Man, right? That was the Rami trilogy. Right. And then we had the amazing Spider-Man. So you can't do either one of those. You can't just go, you can't call it just Spider-Man right. again, right? Yeah. So you would have to call it something else. Now, maybe it gets referenced in Civil War. Maybe they're like, oh, hey, Spider-Man, have fun going home. And then it's like, oh, now it's homecoming. Maybe they tease it somehow in that, or maybe somebody just says, hey, that kid's spectacular. Then you can call it the spectacular Spider-Man. Or you don't need a reason, Civil War. You just need to name it something probably a little cooler than homecoming. We want to hear from you guys. Let us know on the live chat and comment on this YouTube vid right now. What would you title Spider-Man, the first movie from Sony? And would you call it Spider-Man, the dawn of Aunt May? Let us know right now. What's our next story, Natasha? In the upcoming X-Men Apocalypse movie, Apocalypse, played by Oscar Isaac, chooses four mutants to help cleanse mankind, creating a new world order which he will reign. To show off each horseman, X-Men's official Facebook page revealed four new posters, showing off each mutant as the four horsemen. The posters feature Magneto, Storm, Psylocke, and Archangel, with their symbols linking them to war, famine, death, and pestilence. Directed by Brian Singer, X-Men Apocalypse is written by Simon Kinberg and stars James McAvoy, Michael Fassbender, Jennifer Lawrence, Oscar Isaac, and Rose Byrne. The film will hit theaters on May 27th. Schnapp, what do you think of the new posters for X-Men Apocalypse? Very apocalyptic. Um, they're fun. I like them. I, I think Storm looks like a little four-year-old or something, a little baby-faced cheruby. Doesn't really look like the pictures of her or her in real life, uh, but I like them. I especially like the Magneto one. That one looks, you know, nice and bloody red. They're very colorful for how dreary this movie seems to be shaping up, where it doesn't look like the good guys have a shot in hell of winning. And that these four teaming up with Apocalypse seems to spell doom for the entire uh, country, the world, the the galaxy. It's a lot of scary stuff happening here. And I like the look of these posters. I think it's very artsy. It's very graphic novel looking. Um, and I like the symbols that are associated with each one of them. So that's a cool look for me. So these posters, I think they, they don't sell me on the movie any more than I already am because I'm pretty jacked for this movie already. Dennis, so these do these posters move the needle for you at all? Oh, for sure. If this was buy or sell, this would be a big buy for me. I think they're awesome. I think it's funny because I look at them and the first reaction I have is they almost feel like they're not from the studio because the studios always have like, at least most of the time, they have like these safe movie posters with floating heads and whatnot. <laughs> and these actually look really cool. These are the type of posters that I would buy. It, there's a reason why there's a big kind of uh, fan base for these like uh, Mondo posters and mm -hmm. these other things because usually studio posters kind of suck and these are really cool I, I would buy these yeah it's nice to see posters that and, and like a lot of times I look at a poster I'm like would that catch my eye if I'm leaving a movie theater and I like it, like if I see one of these I would probably have to do some research to find out it's an X-Men Apocalypse movie and everything that it involves but just on their face the way the posters look it's such a cool stark contrast like you said Dennis to what you would normally expect to see in an X-Men Apocalypse poster where it would just be every mutant in the movie lined up all like you know flexing so I think it's a cool look it's a 
different take for X Men Apocalypse. It's come a long way since. I don't know if you guys remember that first class. They had some posters. They were terrible. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely oh, right. terrible. It was just like a Photoshop, like yeah, that's uh, right. Professor X head oh, on a Magneto. Horrible. They were, they I, were honestly, I thought right. an intern made them. Yeah. And they're like all lined up weirdly, like <laughs> yeah. different sizes. Like oh. that person's behind them, but they're larger. I, yeah. yeah. Really I think we bad. can all agree X Men First Class should have been called X Men Homecoming. All right, what's the next door? <laughs> After he completes filming on Guardians of the Galaxy Volume <clears throat> Two, Dave Bautista will join another high profile sequel, signing on for an unknown role in Warner Brothers Blade Runner Two. He'll join Ryan Gosling, Harrison Ford, and Robin Wright in the follow up that's directed by Sicario and Prisoner's Helmer, Denis Villeneuve, and written by Hampton Fancher and Michael Green, with the story picking up several decades after the conclusion of Ridley Scott's 1982 original. Warner Brothers will open the film on January 12, 2018. Dennis, are you excited for Dave Bautista joining Blade Runner 2? I don't know if excited is the right word for it, but I'm glad that he's on there. I, I really liked what he did in <laughs> Guardians of the Galaxy with Dragon. Uh, Spectre, on the hand, was kind of disappointing because uh, I thought he would have a bigger role, and he has, like, one line in it. Mm -hmm. And I hope that Denis Villeneuve does something more with him because I, I, I do think that he's a, a guy who can fit a certain... If he fits the, the right type of role, he can nail it. Yeah, he played Captain Phasma in Spectre, basically. Like, it's like this thing, oh, well, man, I can't wait to see all the action. Yeah, and then Inspector is just like, he says, like, one thing. Yes. And then right he's before, just, yeah, you know. I mean, he's still in the movie somewhat, just as a looming presence. And that's, I'm not going to say it's my fear, because I don't have, like, Dave Batista fatheads on my <laughs> wallet at home. But I think that this guy's life right now is just so awesome. Because he basically wakes up, he probably drinks a lot of protein, he goes to the gym for about eight hours, and it's then fun. he comes out, he gets on a movie set, he has, like, one or two lines in a huge blockbuster movie where everybody's going to see his face and then he goes to sleep like right. that's a nice day for that guy so not only do you have guardians of the galaxy 2 which is currently filming you also have blade runner 2 and then like dennis said you got to be a bond villain now whether you were the best bond villain of all time or the maybe the most underutilized more likely it's still nice to see all of the things on this guy's resume i don't know that blade runner 2 is going to be the standout <clears throat> showcase for him as an actor though i think that the the vibe i'm getting is that it's going to be him as as his usual Dave Batista, not a lot of lines, look menacing and scary. Oh, good guy, bad guy, doesn't matter. I think Guardians of the Galaxy 2 is going to be the best showcase for him yet as far as acting chops and whether he can make that transition into be like a true action star or a true action villain like The Rock has. But all of that aside, I think this is a cool play for Blade Runner 2. Doesn't need to be in this movie that much because we already have some pretty big name stars and we're excited to see Blade Runner again. But it's a nice story, right? Yeah, I think uh, he when he got cast, I thought of him instantly as kind of uh, the late uh, Brian James played Leon in the original Blade Runner. He could fill that role really well as kind of the heavy, the muscle behind maybe a new new legion of replicants. If you haven't seen Blade Runner, get on it. It's a great film. It's one of my <laughs> It's in my top five all-time favorite films. And uh, I'm really excited about the casting. At first, when I heard they were going to make a Blade Runner 2, I was down on it. I was like, it doesn't need a sequel. Everything doesn't need a sequel. But the more I keep hearing about it, the talent they have behind it, their director, the cinematographer, uh, the casting, I think it would be great. I loved the scene, uh, Inspector, where he fought uh, Bond on the train. I thought that was like, to mm -hmm. me it at least, cool it was scene. a highlight of that boring movie. So, you know, when I think of Batista, I think of like, oh, he had a weird silver uh, thumb. They didn't do anything with it. And then he had a good fight scene on the train. So I think he's great in Guardians. And I think this he might be able to flex a little bit in this yeah, film. Yeah, I think uh, we interviewed him last year for Spectre. And he he's very interested in becoming an actor, not just an action star. He right, actually right. wants to act. And so I'm sure... He had probably had more lines, Inspector, that they cut out, so I think he was disappointed with that, and so right. hopefully that doesn't happen to him again. That's right. Well, we'll have to wait a few years because Blade Runner comes out in the summer of 2018. Now it's time for Buy or Sell. This is the part of the show where us lads at the table simply say whether we buy or sell a premise brought to us by Natasha. What's up first? Now that Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice has debuted in theaters, fans can now prepare for the next epic superhero beatdown promised in Captain America Civil War. The latest TV spot release shows a bit more action and substance, including Chadwick Boseman's Black Panther coming to blows with Chris Evans' Captain America. The all-star cast that finds Steve Rogers leading one camp of Avengers who want to remain free to defend humanity without government interference, while the other finds Tony Stark's decision to support government oversight and accountability with his own band of Avengers. The movie drops in theaters on May 6th. 
Mark, buy or sell the new TV spot for Captain America's Civil War. It's a buy, Natasha. Quick note. So Blade Runner 2 actually comes out in January 2018, which means you see episode uh, 8, and then a couple weeks later you get to see Blade Runner 2. Have fun with that. This TV spot, huge buy for me because it's a TV spot about Civil War, which what means we're getting closer and closer to actually getting to see the movie. Schnepp and I have a plan. We're working on a scheme. Maybe we get to see it super, super early. <laughs> we'll keep you guys posted. But Dennis, in lieu of that, I think seeing this TV spot, it eliminated a little bit more about Black Panther, mm -hmm. so we know that he's going to be a prominent part of the movie. Got to see a little bit more Black Widow. <laughs> Nothing else really new about this TV spot, but again, these TV spots, I've always said this, are not made for us fans who've been following this movie since we heard it was going to happen, and then Spider-Man's going to be in it, then all these other cool things. These are made for people who may not be aware that Captain America and Iron Man have beef. What yeah, the hell? Right. And I think that if you're coming at it from that perspective, it was a beautifully done TV spot. How about you? I'll buy it as well. I mean, there's a little bit of new footage. You got a new some new lines about him playing both sides mm -hmm. and whatnot. And then, obviously, this picture right here is the end shot of Black Panther and Captain America. Because remember, his shield is made out of vibranium, and uh, Black Panther's claws are made out of vibranium. And so seeing those two kind of go at it, I think, is going to be very fun. It's a vi it's a vibranium fest yes, right. in a couple weeks here at the movie theaters. What about you, Schnapp? Yeah, it's exciting to see Cap and Black Panther. They fought it, fought it out in the comic books for many years, so it's kind of cool to see them you know, at odds with each other. We know they're going to become pals, hopefully, in the end of this film. Oh, do we? Do Spoiler. we? Spoiler. No, do no, we know? I have that? no. It's a, I'm guessing. I haven't. Yeah. I haven't seen the film. And he's but, gonna, they're going to turn to each other. Is she with you? Yeah, I thought she was with you. <laughs> <laughs> Easy, um, boys. Different yeah, universes. Yeah, yeah. Play well, clean. Yeah, we can combine these universes. Yeah, I think that the new trailer is fun. <laughs> they show just a few more clips that we haven't seen yet. So I'm really excited to see this film. I can't wait. So how many more weeks is it? What are we? When are we May seeing Ellis? Something. It's May sixth. Oh. Now, right. look, we we're gonna try to see it in uh, not this <laughs> week, but next weekend. And I yeah. don't know if that's going to happen, but we have a scheme. We're breaking into something. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be like entrapment. I'm Catherine Zeta-Jones. Yeah. You're Sean Connery. Yeah. And my, my, my butt just has to go under that yeah. laser. Be, I hope Ellis, I can be thinner. It. Be thinner. <laughs> be more snake-like. I'm just going to be in the back just eating a sandwich. All right, Ellis, keep going. You almost got it. There's four more lasers. Let me tell you something. I'm going to Detroit this weekend, so me being thinner is not on the agenda. <laughs> Natasha, what's our next buy or sell? Back in 2010, John Favreau signed on to direct Magic Kingdom, a Disney-produced live-action film about a family that goes to Disneyland where all of the main attractions come to life. Pulitzer Prize winning author Michael Chabon was tasked with writing the screenplay, but sadly the project got stuck in development hell. Favreau moved on to direct The More Personal Chef and then went to Disney's The Jungle Book. At the recent press event for Jungle Book, Collider's own Steve Frosty Weintraub asked Favreau about the status of Magic Kingdom. Favreau said, well, hopefully now with this collaboration, we can explore what Magic Kingdom could be. Magic Kingdom is a story I've been developing with Michael Chabon about Disneyland coming to life and all of the different lands and attractions all overlapping one another and creating a big adventure that a family gets caught up in. It's something I feel very passionate about. Part of the reason I explored this technology I used on The Jungle Book is because I was considering it for that film. And maybe it might be something we work together on. Schnepp, what, are we closer to a green light for Magic Kingdom based on Favreau's comments? Uh, my older brother or my younger brother, John Favreau. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know what? I'd love to see him take on the Magic Kingdom. I think he's a really good director and when he's inspired by something, you could tell and it, all that energy comes into it. Now, I didn't see the Jungle Book yet. I saw. I know Ellis and, uh, and Christian got to see it last night. They seem to have really like, look at that face. I think he really liked it. Look at that face again. Look at that face. <laughs> He saw Jungle Book. So, uh, you know, look, Favreau is a, a really good director. And if he's going to take on the Magic Kingdom, that's a lot of characters, a lot of a lot of properties. I think uh, Disney was going to definitely give it to him. And, and I think they trust him. So, Dennis, I'm going to buy it. Uh, I think the green light is coming after the big box office opening of Jungle Book in a few weeks. Uh, I, I hope, you know, if it's as good as you, your face indicates, um, I, I hope that's that's a good thing for John Favreau because he kind of hit a little rut there for a second with <laughs> Iron Man two and Cowboys and Aliens, right. but then he he made Chef, and then if this one's uh, on the money, then I, I think uh, we're looking for a good movie in Magic Kingdom. That's right, and I mean let's say what what this interview really is is that is that John Favreau's like, well, you know, I wanted them to be able to see what I could do with Jungle Book. Basically, he's waiting for Jungle Book to knock it out of the park so he can do whatever the hell he wants next. And if last night was any indication, I think he did just that. 
that. Uh, I'm not going to review Jungle Book totally right now, but the movie's really, really well done, guys. And the effects, the what they're talking about being able to do with making Disneyland come to life. If you can make a jungle come to that realistic of a look and a feel when you're in a movie theater, and I'm believing that this panther's talking and that this bear is singing. It's so much great stuff in the Jungle Book that Disney, assuming the movie performs like they think it will, is literally going to give John Favreau the keys of the Magic Kingdom. And they're going to say, do you want to make Magic Kingdom? Do you want to do a Star Wars spinoff? Whatever the hell you want to do, dude, do it. Go make Chef 2 if you want to eat some more stuff, and then come on back <laughs> and make a huge blockbuster for us. And the prospect, all of a sudden, of seeing the Magic Kingdom come to life, I'm thinking less... I think that they needed the Jungle Book to do this, to get the taste of Tomorrowland yeah. and, and get that memory out of everybody's totally. mouth because Tomorrowland's a lot like Disneyland coming to life. This, on the other hand, you think about actually walking into Disneyland, which I went for the first time since 87 uh, a couple months ago, and I'm like, that would be epic. See, like, the Matterhorn, see Splash Mountain, and, oh, yeah, they have some Star Wars stuff there now, too. So you guys remember that movie, Indian in the Cupboard? Yeah, it's in like the mid well, it was on the book. Oh. It was based on the book. Yeah, the coolest thing, which I did not read, but I saw the movie. The coolest thing about the movie is that all these toys go into the cupboard and they come to life, and that Darth Vader is in it. Darth Vader's mm -hmm. in it because the kid puts a Darth Vader toy in there, and you see Darth Vader, and it's like, oh, Darth Vader in a non-Star Wars movie. So you could get Star Wars character because Disney owns all this stuff now. You could get some cool Star Wars stuff in a Magic Kingdom movie. You could see Han Solo riding teacups. It would be that kind of magical <laughs> adventure. And again, after seeing Jungle Book, anything this guy wants to do, have all the money, you deserved it. I think on Ellis's gravestone, it's going to say, didn't read the book, but I saw the movie. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, That's perfect. Please, let's make that not happen too soon. <laughs> okay, A24 has unveiled the first trailer for their strange yet original adventure dramedy, Swiss Army Man. <laughs> <laughs> the movie debuted at the Sundance Film Festival this past January to a passionate yet controversial response from critics and festival goers. The film, described simply as the farting corpse movie, stars Paul Dano as a man stranded on an island who, as he's about to commit suicide, finds that a corpse, played by Daniel Radcliffe, has just washed ashore. Dano and Radcliffe subsequently embark on a journey that is hilarious, sweet, sad, and incredibly strange. The movie is written and directed by Daniel Kwan and Daniel Scheinart and debuts in theaters June 17th. Dennis, what do you make of the first trailer for Swiss Army Man? Well, I not I never thought I'd say this ever in my life, but I buy the f farting corpse movie. Uh, I actually like the trailer. I, I mean, I had heard about this when Sundance was coming out, and I was like, "What the hell is this?" And it was very controversial. I actually saw the trailer and I liked it because it's more than just the farting right. corpse. It, it's it's more of a fantastical kind of castaway mm. with Paul Dano and and Daniel Radcliffe. Uh, I I like the scene where uh, in the trailer where he uses him to cut the the the, the tree in half yeah paul dano to me is one, one of the best young actors out there you know he was in there will be blood playing against daniel day lewis and he did a great job there also love and mercy last year the beach boys uh movie that he was in he was fantastic so I, i'm actually looking forward to it I, i'm very surprised schnepp do you buy this trailer or do you pass on this guy <laughs> Um, I totally buy it. I, I laughed my ass off, literally. Didn't fart, but almost did. Um, it's a hilarious trailer. It's an incredible premise. Uh, like Daniel Radcliffe is the soccer ball. You know, literally is a castaway. Like, I yeah. I mean, yeah. just see the trailer and tell me you're not gonna. You don't laugh during the trailer. It is really funny. And you know, when I first heard about it, yeah on Sundance, I was like, "What the hell? What is, what is up with? I cannot. What? It made no sense to me seeing this trailer. Now I cannot wait to see this film." Yeah, I'll I'll buy the trailer because I because I think what the movie's doing is very different and unique. It's inventive, but. It, it it's hard for me to say like you need first of all you need to go see this movie this is one where you definitely need to watch the trailer before you go see the flicks so you know what you're getting into right. but I feel really bad for this movie and I'm not sure how you market it at this point because when you already have the no pun intended stench of the <laughs> farting corpse movie on you that people are gonna look at this in a very different light and then when that's all you know about the movie is that oh yeah is that the movie where Harry Potter farts and he's dead <laughs> then you see the trailer 
And that's the first thing they do is like, is, is, is Paul yeah. Dano sees the body, he goes up and then he just unleashes a ripper. It's like, oh God, you're just, now it's going to be known as the Farting Corpse movie. And Weekend this at Bernie's. Put the nail yeah. in the coffin. Yeah, this is Did a, Bernie fart in Weekend at I, Bernie's? I don't remember. I sure hope so. I mean, like, it's one of those things that's in support in a brilliant movie called Corks in the mid 90s is the stuff that happens to you after you die, immediately after you die, your body has to get rid of some stuff. Some weird things happen post mortem, but that's part of the fun with this movie. But it also looks like a very spiritual journey for Paul Dano's character. So the movie I'm totally locked in on, and that's in large part due to the trailer, but them selling this to a large audience, it's not going to be a bunch of giggling sophomore kids like what we are. <laughs> I don't know that this trailer managed to do that. It might have just cemented it deeper as the farting corpse movie. The weirdest film ever made. I think it's, it's operatic in its fartish tone. You know, how are, how are critics going to describe this stench-based film? It really, it's a stinker. How are they going to, what are they going to say? I think it's going to be a masterpiece. Of farts. Of <laughs> <laughs> that is all for Buy or Sell. And now it is time for the very fresh-smelling segment we call Opening This Week, brought to you by our good friends over at AMC Theaters. Natasha, what's coming out this week? All right, well, I don't know. This one kind of seems like a stinker, but <laughs> the <laughs> boss... <laughs> oh, I got jokes. All right. The boss, wealthy mogul Michelle Darnell, played by Melissa McCarthy, always gets her way until she's busted for insider trading and sent to federal prison. After leaving jail, Darnell finds herself broke, homeless, and hated. Luckily, she tracks down her former assistant, Claire, played by Kristen Bell, the only person who's willing to help. While staying with Claire and her young daughter, the ex-con devises a new business model for a brownie empire and i am a huge fan of melissa mccarthy i think she's one of the funniest people on the face of the planet this movie i have a little bit of apprehension going into it though because the trailers haven't really locked me into it i haven't laughed that much watching it i giggled some but the premise i like it's almost like trading places from the perspective of dan Aykroyd as opposed to eddie murphy which seems like something that's going to be ripe for comedy my issue with this is that i think ben falcone's a very good actor and he's married to melissa mccarthy in real life, I believe. I don't know if they wrote this one together, but Ben Falcone directs it, and he also directed her in Tammy, which is just not a good movie at all. It looks like one of those movies where everybody shows up and they just expect the laughs to happen, and they just don't. And it's a, and there's some more dramatic stuff in that movie too, but it aimed for comedy a lot, and it missed the mark on most of those shots. So, getting that stench out of my you know out of my ether before i go in to see this movie is going to be crucial i think the boss looks like it could be a very funny movie i do have a little bit of apprehension dennis to be honest i'm not looking forward to this movie at all <laughs> I, I saw the trailer and i just i didn't laugh like there was only one part that i laughed at which was at the end where it's like right before Kristen Bell goes on a date, and that looked almost like it was improvised anyways. Mm -hmm. Just nothing in this hit it. And I'm not a person who who's like, oh, I'm sick of seeing Melissa McCarthy. I actually I actually like her a lot, and I like the movie she's in. Kristen Bell, I'm a big fan of. She hasn't really hit with movies, uh, except for Forgetting Sarah Marshall. And she's been in like all, I, yeah, I'm just not looking forward to it. How about you, Schnapp? Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> nope. Uh, like the trailers, a uh, flat line for yeah. me. They were turgid messes. Uh, nothing funny about them. They were, uh, I don't no no. I don't want to see this movie. I I love Melissa McCarthy and Kristen Bell, and it's like every the trailers are just so flat and unfunny, and like that forced awkward comedy where everyone probably on set was like, "Is that funny? I don't know. It'll probably be really funny once we cut it together." And then the person editing is like, "Kill me." So <laughs> it's, it looks the like only, garbage. The man. only possibility is it's a rated R movie, and maybe they just couldn't show the best jokes in the trailer. That's the only only thing I'm clinging That's on what, to. But that happened with Grimsby. I mean. It's like you saw Grimsby. Right? I did, yeah. And it was funnier than the trailers, right? It was. It was. It was <laughs> funnier than the trailers. But the trailers not only did I think weren't that funny, but they also like used jokes I'd seen done in other yeah. places right. before. Right. So I had. I, I was not looking forward to that, and it actually pleasantly surprised me to a point where it's very shocking comedy. Here, you're not going to have the benefit of shock value. I know it's rated R, but the main reason why it's rated R is because Melissa McCarthy loves dropping f bombs. And when I saw Spy, I thought Spy was a pleasant surprise to me. That was directed by Paul Feig, who mm -hmm. also did. Uh, yeah. The Heat, so he and and he helped on on Bridesmaids, and he's doing Ghostbusters. So he's worked with Melissa McCarthy a lot too. He's not involved with this picture. He's at least not directing it. So that's why that that's where my apprehension comes from. Because I think Melissa McCarthy. I don't mind, and I want to get your guys' take on this. Is that a lot of people complain that oh she's just doing the same thing that she does in every movie? Do you think she has to switch it up now, or do you think she can just come on screen, be really funny, and we're gonna go home happy? 
Well, I, I think there's just kind of the fatigue. Some people have the fatigue of just seeing her too much. People will always say that about a lot of people, even if they are playing different versions of themselves. People will just be like, oh, I'm sick of seeing this person's face or whatnot. So I, I, I think that's what's going on with her. I think I love Melissa McCarthy. I loved Spy, but there was this one moment towards the end of Spy where she became like, she dropped her character and became Melissa McCarthy and started doing the the Melissa McCarthy thing where I, I was kind of like a little disappointed even though I loved Spy I thought the overall the whole film's good there was a little 10 minute section of it I don't know if you remember that where it's like oh she's just being Melissa McCarthy and like riffing and doing all this kind of funny stuff but she wasn't her character anymore this trailer for the boss it just it doesn't it just stinks it does so look like a character she bad. would crush in a sketch yes and so i hope that that sketch translates to a 90 minute movie okay i'm seeing the movie tonight so we'll find out very soon okay it's now time for mailbag mailbag is when you guys get to participate in the show like you haven't so far in the live chat you get to write an email right and you send that email into us and we pick a couple to read live on the air we also re want to remind you guys that at the end of the show today we're going to take your live twitter questions so tweet us right now at Collider Video, and Natasha's going to read a few of them if you guys are very nice to her and try to ease up on the fart jokes. We handled that in the last segment. What's up first in the mailbag, Natasha? Okay, Joshua writes, Hey, Collider, I recently subscribed to your channel about a month ago, and I have been hooked ever since. My question for you guys is, what is your favorite decade movie-wise? Mine changes from day to day, but right now it's the 80s, Star Wars. Thanks. You guys are awesome. Keep making great content. Well, Joshua, I love the question, first of all. It's a, it's a great query i think a lot of it depends on the time that you grew up in when you were a kid learning about movies for the first time and i'm gonna surprise some people right now because when you think of me you probably think that i love 80s rock and i do 80s rock is amazing it's a great force for unifying the planets and aligning the galaxy i think that 70s movies are my favorite decade as a whole because i know you were very excited about star wars having empire and return of the jedi in the 80s but we got a new hope in 1977 we also got jaws we also got rocky we also got animal house we also got monty python the holy grail we also got the exorcist those movies to me make up the core of my favorite films of all time that aren't Jedi or Empire Strikes Back. Also so, got Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Close Encounters of the Third Kind, another one. So and, Godfather. And we got Van Halen 1 and Van Halen 2. So, Schnepp, what do you think is the best decade for movies? Are you agreeing with my old school 70s approach? I could do either 70s or 80s. I'll just, just to be different, I'll say 80s. Well, fine. Um, you know, you got Blade Runner, you got Conan the Barbarian, you got Tron, you got uh, The Thing, and that's just 1981. Or was it 82? That was it's 82, one, yeah. yeah. 82 that was, was like, like one That was like one Wrath of Khan. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, there was like that one summer of 82, yeah. Is, you could, put, your, you could put that one month in 1982 yeah. versus any other decade know, and come it, out. It's okay. pretty rocking. And then, of course, you got The Empire Strikes Back. I believe that was 1980. Mm -hmm. uh, there was, a, yeah, I mean, I think the 80s, and that's just the first couple of years of the 80s. All of the amazing, the 16 Candles, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, all of the John Hughes movies, The Breakfast Club, all of those are 1984 through 88, 89. You had so many incredible action films in the 80s. I mean, I, for me, I, I, that, I love the 80s. Yeah, we really so. got the advent of the coming of age film, yeah. Spider-Man not included, in the 80s. So Dennis, I took 70s, he took 80s. So now you're going to be stuck with 90s. Are you cool with that? <laughs> no, because it actually... You got Jack, son! No, no, no. Because no. it's actually even more recent than that. Because what? Yeah, because I, I started wow. thinking about I thought, oh, maybe it's the 70s or 80s. I grew up in the 80s and 90s. I, I looked at uh, the list and I, I realized a lot of my favorite movies come from the 2000s. Let me nice. list you some of them. We have uh, uh, There Will Be Blood, The Wrestler. We have City of God, uh, The Proposition, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, yeah. Prestige, The Dark Knight. Uh, Tarantino did Kill Bill Vault 1s and 2, uh, Inglorious Bastards. These, some of those are my favorite right. movies of all time. So. I think for especially for me that the 2000s when it was when I was starting to understand movies on a different level than than previously mm -hmm. and so a lot of those movies spoke to me. Yeah, th there's holes you can poke in each decade, which yes. may not be right. fair to do, but like the 70s, the 80s, the thing that they lacked, despite having like Superman the movie and having Batman in 1989, you really didn't get this great advent of comic book movies that we have now and get right. to celebrate all the time until we got into what Dennis is talking about. By contrast, I think that 2000 on, maybe even in the late 90s, it's just started, comedy just started to be harder to make for some reason. I don't know what it was. I don't know that Jim Carrey started being more 
more dramatic. Eddie Murphy decided he didn't really care about making funny movies anymore. Right. I don't know what it was. I mean, old school's great. Step Brothers are great. Wedding Crashers, Bridesmaids. But I think the 70s and the 80s were the best two decades as far as comedy goes. Yeah, we can't forget the 90s. The 90s had Pulp Fiction. The 90s like ushered in independent film in a brand new way, even though it was like still like bigger budget independent film. Now independent film's like 500,000 or less, but independent film in the, the 90s was like, we're doing it for five million or eight million. That was like, oh, you can actually make a movie for that. So can't forget those films. Yeah, we don't want to forget the 60s either and is everything that what happened before What about the 30s, guys? Yeah. Dude, yeah. the 30s was great. What? Okay, so Bella you... Bella Lugosi? The 30s was awesome because in 1933, <laughs> you had King Kong. And then listen yeah. to this murder's row you had in 1939. You had The Wizard of Oz, you had Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, and you had Gone with the Wind all in one year. And back Fantastic. then, that was unbelievable <clears throat> to get movies like that that still hold up. You get into the 40s, you get Citizen Kane. Right. When you go to the 60s, you get everything from Psycho to Easy Rider. So there's a lot of good movies. I'm just talking about dates now. Okay. What's yeah, our you next sound question? like Scott Manning. 1943. Scott in 1977. Yeah. In 1932. It came out on Saturday. In 1957. By the way, that's a great thing to bring up. If you guys have not seen the matchup, the schmodown between Scott Mance and John Roca that we aired on Collider Video, it's up right now. You guys can go check it out after Movie Talk. It's incredible. It may be the best finish we've ever had. Make sure you guys go check that out. And then this week, we have Sam Levine versus Hal Rudnick going up. Hal Rudnick from Screen Junkies. Sam Levine from Freaks and Geeks. He is a fountain of knowledge. Will he hold up against Rudnick? Tweet us and hashtag Schmodown to get your voice heard. And now on with the mailbag. Okay, Gary Richardson writes, Hey Collider, with Indiana Jones 5 now greenlit and hopefully as good as the original 3, I would like to ask you to think back to Raiders, Temple of Doom, and The Last Crusade and tell me firstly which of them is the best for you and secondly why is that? What makes the film stand out? For me it's Last Crusade because I feel like it got back to what made Indy the success he was from Raiders plus you have Sean Connery appearing as his father. Thanks for taking my question and keep up the great work. <coughs> I love Gary's question because it's worded like something that would be on a test in high school. It's like, okay, so we have to tell you what movie, then we have to so tell you why that is. What makes it stand out versus the other two movies? I feel like I'm in school again, and I'm going to ace this test because I'm going to say that I agree with you, Gary. I think The Last Crusade is my favorite Indiana Jones movie. It's it's between that and Raiders of the Lost Ark, but I'm going to throw a shout-out to Temple of the Doom real quick, too, because Temple of the Doom... Uh, it's. I think it's my third favorite Indiana Jones movie, which is a high bar to it's hit. Temple of Doom. It is There's no the Doom. Temp do I say Temple of the Doom? Yeah. Did I say that? Yeah. You I'm, said it twice, dude. That's why I have to. I knew. It. I knew King Kong came out in '33. Give me a break. You get it. Seeing Harrison Ford in 1984 in Indiana Jones and the Temple of the Scary Doom. <laughs> that guy is like the most perfect movie star that we may have ever had on the face of the planet. He's in like that white tux and he's walking down a club Obi Wan. It's like. That is something different. That's a different species than what I am. So I'll give him that. I'm going to take Last Crusade for now. I might change my pick after you guys give yours. Why? Uh, what's your favorite one and why? Oh, uh, it's it's a very close between Raiders and Last Crusade. Mm -hmm. uh, but ultimately, I'm going to have to go with Last Crusade as well because I like the dynamic of Sean Connery and Harrison Ford in that movie. And also seeing young Indy played by River Phoenix in the beginning also was great. I, I think maybe the pace of it. I love Raiders of the Lost Ark, but it, it, it is a long film for an action adventure film. It's like, oh, I think over two it hours. Is, yeah. uh, I think The Last Crusade, I, I don't remember the runtime on it, but it didn't feel as, as long. How about you, Junior? Uh, well... I'm going with the original. Raiders of the Lost <laughs> Ark is my favorite of all of the uh, Indiana Jones films. Uh, I told uh, this story uh, a couple weeks ago. That's a, f a film I snuck into as a kid. I didn't even know what it was. I was like, Han Solo is in this movie, but it's like a <laughs> Western or something. Let's go see it. Me and a friend snuck in, and literally we saw it right as the Paramount logo turned into the mountain, so we didn't miss anything. And uh, I'll never forget it. It was one of the most exciting and fun uh, film experiences I've, I've ever had. And, you know, it's, it stands up every viewing, you know, from Bad Date to, like, him on the truck with the horses and just all the action scenes all the way down to the, the Ark of the Covenant at the end. I mean, there's so many fun set pieces and action scenes in that film. Harrison Ford, Karen Allen. To me, the original Raiders of the Lost Ark. I didn't like when they changed the title to Indiana Jones and the and the Lost Ark. It's like it's Raiders of the Lost Ark, and that's what it is. And that's my favorite. I, you know, yeah, you got the boulder, you got the snakes. Uh, there, there's Throw me the idol, give me the whip. You know, it's all Alfred that. Alfred Molina, yeah, gentlemen. Alfred Molina. Um, I think I, I think I'm going to stick with Last Crusade, not just because of what Dennis said. It was a great point about the multi generational Joneses in there, mm -hmm. but. 
if there's a tiebreaker, it's got to be the end credits when it's all four of them riding off into the sunset. And it's it's Marcus Sola uh, Jr. and then his dad, Sean Connery. And it's just like the most beautiful moment. I get so upset when I'm watching it on like TNT and then it comes on, then it ends and they just go, oh, coming up next on TNT. Uh, I'm like, no, this is one credit. You stay on that. The entire time. Well, the yeah. end credits for Raiders of the Lost Ark, they're like, where, where are they putting it? And it's just that dude with all those boxes where they're hiding it. You know, come on, we man. Top men. Okay, Kingdom top of the Crystal Skull. Man gets a lot of crap for its ending as it should I, yeah. I, I will say the ending for uh last crusade is pretty ridiculous as what's well. ridiculous about that Dennis? The, there's an 800 year old yeah. guy he's been hanging yeah, out he's just been, been hanging out while. just hanging out there he's, he's totally fine i love how rusty he is though when he when he sees any of he's like oh i gotta defend this thing and then the sword's like so heavy for him and <laughs> it's like right. yeah do we have some questions about what he's been taking a to make himself look that blue b the fact that he's 800 years old that's one farting corpse ladies and gentlemen <laughs> so now we're going to go on to live twitter questions which is where natasha has some picked out we'll hear them right now what's up first hi toe 12 asks can you guys discuss the implications of virtual reality on the movie industry dennis probably knows what these headsets can do thanks Oh, yeah. Mm. So uh, I'm going to go all the way back to Lawnmower Man. Remember that Stephen King movie? And it's like virtual reality movies. Uh Where is this going to go? And then we just kind of stopped talking about virtual reality for a little bit. For a very long time. I saw an article. I I think it was trending on Twitter or something about these glasses that you put on and it puts you in the movie, like in a 3D looking universe. Is this the thing with like the where you feel like you're in the movie theater? Is that what we're talking about here? No, I think he's he's talking about an actual like VR movie where where the experience is the actual like so instead of watching you know the main difference is you watch a movie it's the director choosing you know the edits the shots and all that stuff when you put on a vr helmet you're choosing what to look at what to do and so that fundamentally changes what a movie would be does that sound appealing to you boys at the risk of sounding like an old codger sitting on the porch of a cracker barrel um (laughs) i don't want to work that hard when I go see a movie, I don't necessarily, I don't want to be in The Force Awakens. I right. don't want to have to go through all that. So that's a lot of work. That's a lot of sweat. It's a lot of calories you got to burn. I just want to sit back and watch other heroes on an adventure and other villains and have somebody like a J.J. Abrams or a Steven Spielberg tell me what the story is as opposed to me having to live it. Now, having said that, that's probably going to sound totally outdated in five years, but me and my screening room box will just <laughs> yeah. be in my apartment by myself. And you guys can go experience <laughs> virtual reality if you want to. Well, let me ask you this. You saw Hardcore Henry. Uh, I did. What if that was some done like, I mean, because that's the only way I can imagine this VR kind of experience working well is it has to integrate you because like you said, Dennis, you're the you're the main, yeah. you're the viewer. But then the if it's a movie, it has to kind of pull you along the story. So you'll need someone or something like that kind of Hardcore Henry POV experience where you're like, you're on a spaceship or something, something along those lines where you're not running in order to fully make it feel like you're part of the experience. It would but be it's a not cool a movie. event to it's, get geared it's, yeah, up for. It's not a movie, yeah. though. That's the, the biggest difference is what you said. A movie is a script with actors and shot selections and telling a story. This is a completely different experience. You could still call it a movie, but it would be like an interactive yeah, movie, an interactive, interactive movie. experience. It's, it's the same kind of way I feel about uh, there's these telltale games on, on <clears throat> you know, all this, the video game systems that, you know, they have The Walking Dead, they have right. Game of Thrones, and people are like, oh, and to me, that's not really a game. It's more like interactive television because you're kind of watching a story unfold, but then you choose certain things. Uh, I feel like they will come out with something like an interactive movie where it'll be different from what we're doing now um, that you kind of participate in. But at the same time, there's still someone pulling the puppet, you know, the strings right. for, for the puppet. So I, I think it'll be like a new medium. You know, it works really well in horror video games. I never thought that horror video games would have much appeal to me, but I was playing that Silent Hill like demo that they're working on. And you're di- it's basically just like one hallway and you're walking around it. Yeah. It is terrified yeah. man so if you could put me in a horror movie i think that'd be pretty cool like around halloween it's much better than being like walking through a haunted house and just having like some dude they hired to play a wolf man for eight bucks an hour jump out at you but i so maybe virtual reality in that vein but as a movie going experience like on a week to week basis i think it'll be like a once in a year kind of well thing. i think horror is the forefront for that particular because it can play with your senses and your your, your eyes and your ears and right. everything so i think that might be the first genre that kind of breaks out for like whatever this new medium is it'll scale it's scary until you turn into the corpse <laughs> it'll scale you it'll scale yeah. you it'll scale you what's our next very one very scary all right chris hartwell scary. asks how many more years do you think until digital releases completely replace blu-rays 
Uh, I think it'll be a few years. It's I think few. I think Blu-ray's got a good got a good shelf life left. But it's funny because when they got into the industry, you knew that Blu-rays weren't going to be around forever. Like as opposed to like when they had like VHS. Like okay, this is the thing. Right. Never get any better than this. Then Laserdisc came out, and then it was like, no, 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 you got to get lasers. You got to get a disc. It's this big. DVD. Remember, what? remember Divix yeah. versus DVD? Yes. They had this big war as to who's going to win the rest of eternity. And then Blu-rays are around, and Blu-rays. Red rays. Remember they had the red ray yeah. versus the blue ray. It was red versus blue. I do not remember that. Yeah. Like Halo? Uh, it was like that. It was an HD DVD, which was like the red yeah. oh, box right. versus the blue ray. And they had that big battle. And then Warner Brothers sided with blue ray. And it was pff, everyone who bought a red ray, including me, my dumb ass. Because it was like, <laughs> it was like here you get a red, red ray player and eight DVDs for 200 bucks. And then literally two days later, blu ray won the war. And I was like, what the? You know, I was really pissed. It was game was, over, man. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to throw a date at you guys. You guys tell me if we're going to be totally digital by this date. So King Kong versus is Godzilla comes out in 2020 and boy what a day that's going to be right. at my screening room um do you guys <laughs> think that by that time we're going to be wanting to get movies still on blu-ray or do you think we're going to be moving totally digital well I'll I'll say this uh what we're in right now we have no one's buying DVDs anymore really there's a couple you know they still buy them but they're not really selling that well Blu-rays are for collectors only, really. It's people who like, I want to have the best quality film. I want to have the extras. I want to have the commentary tracks. I want to have the deleted scenes. All that kind of stuff, that's what you get with a Blu-ray and you could pack it in, you know? Um, I think Blu-ray, and now that they've got 4K coming around, you're going to have the uh, you know, upgraded Blu-ray 4K, which a lot of people are who have just regular Blu-rays are like, come on, I just upgraded all my DVDs to Blu-rays. Now I have this newer format. That's where it's going to, you know, you're going to chop out a lot of people right there where people are like, look, I'll just get it digitally. But yeah, 2020 Blu-rays will still be around. I don't think there's it's, I don't see the market completely dying for another 10 years. But you know. Dennis, what about you? Uh, yeah, I think for the most part, it's all going to be digital streaming. It's going to be the streaming is going to get better right now. We're getting about HD through Netflix. It's not as good as Blu-ray. But eventually the speeds are going to catch up and mm -hmm. we're going to get to that point of where all your library of content is going to be up in the cloud and you're going to be able to get it there instead of buying blue. I buy Blu-ray still. I right. want the best quality. I want the commentaries. I want the behind the scenes, all that stuff. But, I, you know, I, I'm in the minority for that. And then we're going to turn into those humans from Wally, -E where we just sit yes. in our little pods and just <laughs> yes. zoom around. And well, we got the VR helmet. We're going to have the VR helmets, right? <laughs> right. And then, pod people. Yeah. That's so we're, scary. We're be... <laughs> hey, we'll, we'll do the show. <laughs> Right from home, we won't come into the yeah. studio anymore. I don't Everybody need to just come puts in. in the VR yeah. helmets, and there'll be like virtual representations. <laughs> yeah, of Cheetos us, right? dust on the face. I'm just having yeah. hanging out with crackers. <laughs> <laughs> you guys don't already sleep here? Okay, yeah. let's go to our next Twitter question. <laughs> okay, speaking of Blu-rays, Philippe Zambrano asks, "Hey, Collider Crew, now that the Force Awakens Blu-ray is out, when will the commentary be uploaded?" Oh, good that's a question. good question. Uh, I have it set for <laughs> 2 p.m. Pacific time. So right now it is almost noon here. So oh, two today? hours. Yeah, two hours. Oh, minutes. awesome. Wait, so I have to do the commentary between now and then? That puts a lot of pressure on me, for Dennis. For Force Awakens? Yeah. Oh. Oh, you guys already. Yeah. Oh. Oh, uh, oh, that's, oh that's right. Ellis didn't get the memo. Uh, yeah. Oh. Excuse me, I'll just see myself out. Oh. I'll be back for Jedi. I can't wait to watch it with you guys. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> Schnapp, Harloff, Campia, and David Griffin. I was supposed to be on it, but then I had other things I had yeah, to see, do. Yeah, see, we, we had stuff to do. Schnapp. So, hey. Can I ask one question What's about up? it? Sure. You just give us a preview. Like, how much am I going to hate the Conja Club scene with you, you guys? You are going to hate the Conja Club <laughs> scene. Like, you probably have never hated it. it. You're Like, you never hated it before. I. I New levels of hatred. Okay. All right. I like the scene in the movie, just the fallout. You were great so. in it, dude. That's all I can say. <laughs> Natasha, what's our next Twitter question and our final one for today? Okay. Ultimate Screen Time asks, do you guys think that the Jungle Book will start a complete CGI world craze? Uh, yeah, I kind of do. I mean, that thing's expensive as F to make, so you're not going to see every studio cranking these things out left and right, but if this movie is any indication, you can have an entirely digital world and make it not look like Phantom Menace, which God knows I love Star Wars. This thing is a revelation because you feel like you are in the jungle the entire time. There isn't one moment where, even if you're looking at some of the animals and you're like, okay, yeah, it's a little CG. It's like, but they're in a real jungle. It's just that maybe occasionally you see CGI <laughs> animals. So it's, it's an incredible feat. I can't wait for you guys to check it out. I highly recommend seeing it in a theater. How about you guys? Is this going to be a new, the dawn of a new age for, uh, for movies? 
Uh, I'm not too sure. I mean, they still have the the kid, right? He's live action as he well. He is a live action human being. Yeah. I think when it comes to the actual people, though, I mean, Avatar kind of did a similar thing. Obviously, right. that wasn't a realistic world. That was on a you know sci-fi planet, but all those environments were all created digitally, and they're just walking around. And so I I feel like maybe that will be a new thing where it's like live action actors within this kind of virtual environment right how about you snap well it's happening more and more all the time i mean even just like tv shows you watch the the characters when they anytime they're outside it's a green screen but it's in what it's called an invisible effect you don't think about it when you see a lawyer you know with a coffee like oh, i'm walking to the office but it's actually a, just a fake shot because mm -hmm. it's cheaper to shoot a green screen than like block off a real set in new york so they just go ahead and shoot plates and so that's kind of what's going on now a full CG world, like you said, Dennis, Avatar has already done it, but I haven't seen Jungle Book, but everything that I see from it looks so incredibly hyper-realistic that I, I think you're right. More and more films will be taking advantage of the digital lot. Yeah, so. I mean, look, the best part to me about Terminator Jenny Smith was seeing old Arnold Schwarzenegger fighting young Arnold Schwarzenegger and that looking pretty realistic. So mm -hmm. if they can have a fight in the jungle and none of it's real, I'd pay to see that movie. So it's, the, it's a new step that we've taken in movies. Check out Jungle Book trust me okay well that's all the time we have for today on movie talk i want to thank everybody both behind the desk and in front of the camera hanging out with me today first of all mr dennis zang where can the kids find you well uh yeah like we said star wars the force awakens blu-ray commentary up in a couple hours watch a uh, tv talk last night i was on that episode with makuga uh, Sasha Pearl Raver, David Griffin, and Sinead DeFries. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Think Hero or on Instagram, Dennis.TZNG. The not gassy at all, John Schnapp. Hey, you guys can follow me on Instagram and uh, Twitter, just at John Schnapp. Check out my Kickstarter, uh, Sweaties Unite, Rise of the Uber Nerd. Donate, become a backer. And also, Heroes is on later today. And she has no friends that are corpses. Natasha Martinez, where can we find you? <laughs> you guys can find me on Twitter and Instagram at NatashaAlexis underscore and at Facebook, Facebook slash NatashaAlexisMartinez. I would like to thank everybody behind the desk over there. We have Jonathan, Adam, Wendy, Mark, Riley. Thank you guys so much for everything you do. I missed you kids. And this weekend, I am going to be in Royal Oak, Michigan. It's near Detroit, just safer at the Comedy Castle doing stand-up Thursday through Saturday. You can get tickets at my website, markellislive.com. Also, make sure you guys check out the Jungle Book review from Schmoes No. Go subscribe to our YouTube channel. Christian and I are going to have that review up later on today. And hashtag Schmodown for this Friday's main event between... Sam Levine, and Hal Rudnick. For everybody here, my name is Mark, and we'll see you guys tomorrow. Welcome to Conja Club. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.